the boot camp. This is the halfway class. We're halfway towards that week six goal of finishing that pilot in just six weeks of writing. So we're going from idea to finished draft of a brand new half hour or hour long pilot. Um, so this is the last class that we have on pre-writing. So we spend this first half, the first three weeks, we have the extra week in here um, just as like a help work session. But normally it's just three weeks for figuring out everything that happens on every page of your story where we try to move from that story beats outline to the much more detailed scene card breakdown, which is going to be a full paragraph for every scene that's going to end up being about, you know, between four and ten pages long, depending on how detailed your scene cards are and how long your pilot script is. Um, and we're going to use that to try to flesh out our ideas for the story and get everything in proper working order so that by the time we get to actually writing and going to pages, which we'll be doing next week, we're not doing the double duty of trying to figure out what happens in each scene and also trying to execute each scene. We should just be doing one of those at a time, at least in the method that I use and that I teach here. You are free to use whatever methods you want to try to make your drafts work, but I'm you know, really emphasizing this heavily architect-focused method of really trying to plan out every single move you're going to make before you begin. Um, okay, so we will have some time for feedback on story beats outlines today. Let's look at our slideshow and get going. So, um, Skill Camp, you can remember to drop by our different communities and say hi. Lots of other stuff happening. We have weekly classes currently on Code Camp and Toon Camp. These are all free public classes in animation and coding. With new stuff coming soon in Film Camp and Lingo Camp that we'll be announcing as that stuff comes up. Um, here's a list of everything going on right now. We have currently Pilot Boot Camp is Fridays at 6. There's three weeks left in this class. We have Feature Boot Camp Sundays at 11. There's about the same amount of time left in that class. We have script analysis starting in February that will be on Thursdays. We have new novel writing classes every Saturday in WordCamp. Um, that is going to be, uh, except for, we're not, there's not one tomorrow, but everyone after tomorrow there's going to be a brand new fiction writing class on, on WordCamp, um, 12 to 2 Pacific time. We also have plenty of other weekly things going on, script swaps on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. We um, have, we're, tr we're changing the date of this protagonist class that you see on the thing here. I know we've changed it before, but we are uh, reassessing and moving that up a little bit, but we're still gonna have that at some point. Um, we have our horror workshop, Tuesdays at six, Fantasy Club is Sundays at five, Table Reads, Sundays at two, Writer's Lab, Saturdays at four. For all our subscribing members, you can come and ask questions and bring up to five pages of something you're working on if you wanna get one-on-one -on -one feedback in the lab from four to six. Here's everything coming up, all the new stuff. So we're doing first pages on the 28th, writing action and adventure on Saturday, February 4th, query letter class on February 8th. We have a manuscript editing class with a editor guest, Max Higgins, on February 11th at 12th. Then we have how to outline a novel on Wednesday, February 15th, and that's all leading up to the start of our new novel boot camp, Saturday, February 18th at noon, where you're gonna write a whole book in that boot camp. Um, new sessions of feature starts Friday, February 17th at 6. New session of TV starts March 5th at 11. So you can donate, you can become supporting members and get access to all the boot camps and labs, which um, many folks here have already done. You can volunteer if you know a skill or language that you'd like to teach. You can contact me or Nacho. And last, remember to do these referrals. If you refer somebody and bring them in, you'll both get a free month of Unlimited. And you'll both also get the free month of, um, of Arc Studio Pro, a great screenwriting software. All right, here's the schedule for what we're doing now. So we're on week three outlining. That's going to be today, January 20th. We're going to try to complete those scene cards by next week. First act is going to be next weekend, tw the 27th. And from then on, if you're writing half hour, you're going to write 10 pages a week. And if you're writing full hour, you're going to write 20 pages a week, which is just about four pages per weekday. So I think you can manage it. Um, it's going to be about two pages per weekday if you're writing half hour. So, so second act, February 3rd, third, third act, February 10th, and, and that first draft entirely is going to be completed by February 17th. Questions, questions on the schedule? schedule? All right, let's, let's move on. on. So, uh, so overview, overview of today, we'll do a check-in, and you can tell us about your progress and any major questions or problems you were having in your first pass through your scene card or through your story beats outline. Um, you'll also tell us about the great scripts you've been reading recently, which we will ask about every week, and you'll tell us just what you noticed, liked, and learned, and basic stuff like that. There's no right or wrong answers, but just 
you must be reading week by week, either pilots if you're in the pilot camp or features if you're in feature camp, or maybe novels too if you're working on novels. Um, so today we'll look at scene cards and some scene card examples, including we can just um, break down some completed scene card documents from before. We will look at structure and just any lingering questions that we have on structure to make sure these gaps are sort of being filled. And also we'll discuss the proper sort of conventions that pertain more to novel or to pilot writing than more to feature writing because there is just a different set of skills and a different series of things that we have to do in this type of writing. I don't think we'll probably have time for the exercise at the end, but you never know. We sometimes do. Um, and of course, we'll have plenty of time for questions throughout. Okay, so go ahead and post those story beats in the assignments channel. If you've not already done so. If you have, then we're going to go down the list and you can tell us about progress on the thing that you've been writing and also just what scripts have you been reading lately? What have you liked, noticed, and learned? All right, we'll start with Joe Till. Do you want to give us an update on what you, I know you're not doing a pilot, but do you want to give us an update on where you are with your project? Um, I don't have a great answer to this at the moment, unfortunately. I'm sorry. Um, so I'll have a little quick think about it and maybe uh, go to leave. And then... Okay. okay. Um, we feel, feel free to chime in if you'd like to give us an update. Us an update. We will move to leave. Awesome. So I, um, yeah, so I posted my new story beats in the assignments channel this afternoon. And thank you, Connor, for the feedback on that. Um, I am really happy that basically like the feedback that I got last week, not only helped me revise this, um, this outline, these story beats, but helped me notice a pattern in like how I write things. Mm. Um, which is to say like, I, my first pass tends to be a lot more dramatic and overstuffed than it should be. Mm -hmm. And that's happened multiple times. And this time, like, really, it clicked, like, oh, okay, so this is just something that I do. So I need to just do that, get it out of my system, and then write, like, the second version. Um, so that was really, really helpful. Um, I read Insecure pilot script this week. It was awesome. And it was really, um, you know, how, like, one of the pieces of advice is to like touch on work, home and play um, and those kinds of areas of a character's life that was super apparent in that script um, and really well done. Is that so, a half hour yeah. script as well? Yeah, it's a half hour. It is, but and it's kind of a dramedy, right? Yes. So a lot going on for a half hour, I'm guessing, like more sort of to the character. It's not quite just a standard sitcom, right? Yeah, it's it's definitely more like it, it reads like a character study, like kind of like in it, the way that Fleabag does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the same way as like Fleabag or Feel Good, it's very much focused on this one character and kind of what's going on inside her head. And, um, yeah, it's really good. And then cool. also the other one I read was called Like Magic, um, which is much closer to sort of what I'm writing, which is more like a character kind of entering a profession and sort of being a, a newcomer at it and, and sort of navigating like this new workspace. And um, yeah, that was great. It's about this like young woman who um, wants to become a stage magician. Great. And also a half hour. Is, is that, that on TV or, or is that just a, a, I, uh, a script? I looked that up. I If it was produced, Produced. I think it got picked up, but hasn't been released or produced. Hmm, I see. Like, so I, th in production I think it's kind of in the in wings Colorado. or something, yeah. Right, right, that makes sense. Um, cool. Well, great that you're reading multiple things per week, and you should keep that up and keep um, keep, keep reading, keep noticing, and, and taking notes on things. You don't have to, like, write a full essay on it every time, but as long as you're reading stuff enough that you can talk about it, things that you notice or learn, then that's all great. Um, and, yeah, you're... Seen, you're Story beats outline was looking a lot stronger. I noticed the main character is a little different in this pass through, and you're saying that she sort of has more of an attachment to this job now. Is that right? Yes, definitely. So she's passionate about plumbing. She is passionate about um, she <laughs> pissing off her parents, and oh, she okay. sees plumbing as a way to do that. But it's but it is a stronger she she has a stronger connection to the the profession for sure than she did in the last version. Right. So he's like, now she sees her new boss 
as a mentor who's going to get her exactly where she wants to be. It's not just like any job that I need to make the ends meet, right? Exactly. Yeah. I see. Yeah, that's probably the right move just because awesome. if your job ends up being really hard, most people are like way more difficult than you expected. Most people would just get another job. Um, so right. you, we, have to, we have to ask this question of why would your character bother to stay? And often having characters that care about what they're doing and care about the situation that they're in are almost always going to be stronger because we believe and we buy and we invest in the, the idea that they need to continue what they're doing, even though it has revealed itself to have, to have unexpected challenges. Awesome. So I think that's the right move. And um, just the, the simplicity of the plot seemed to be working a lot better. Um, the more abstract that things get, that, especially in something like a sitcom, just the harder it gets to invest and to understand what's happening. And to, um, especially if, imagine somebody turns it on 10 minutes in, like we want them to still be able to sort of enjoy what's going on on a network type right. sitcom because, uh, and so, and to that end, we usually can't have plots that are way too complicated or that motivations that are too sort of esoteric in the realm of right. like ha half hour comedies. Um, so yeah, I oh, think everything was yeah. shaping up well. Go ahead. Sorry. The other thing I remember, the other thing that I did this week was I rewatched the pilot for Bloods, which I kind of identified as one of the comps. Um, it's it's another like two hander workplace comedy, um, half hour. Is a workplace and comedy. What's that about? It's about EMTs. It's fantastic. Oh. It is. It's from the UK, mm. and um, and I didn't. I couldn't find a pilot script, but I actually watched it like and had the screen split with a document to outline it as nice. I was watching it. And so I wrote an outline for the Bloods pilot and then was able to see like, oh, okay, so this is this is how simple it is. And like, right. this is how they, you know, it they have this number of locations and this, you know, this is how the relationship kind of shifts from beginning to end. So it was awesome. It was really Great. helpful. I think there's a couple ambulance shows in the UK. Isn't there, isn't there one called Sirens also that had a US remake as well? That sounds right. I haven't seen that. I think it was on USA for two seasons or something like that. Um, but but there's ne I don't, as far as I know, there's never been a big hit breakout kind of ambulance show. But there have been a couple. Yeah. Of I mean, it's a good idea. It's very clear what you'll be doing week after week, isn't it? So This one has more slapstick in it than the others that I've <laughs> heard of. So goofy. this is the one that I've watched all the way through. Yeah, it's I great. See. Okay, well, yeah, probably good reading for a year on then because your, your own tone seems pretty wacky as well. Yep. All right. Any big questions on that? No, I think I'm good. Okay, cool. So thank if you. You're, if you're falling behind or if anyone needs any extra help, um, then today is a day to ask those questions and to make sure you're getting unstuck. If not today, then tomorrow we have lab from four to six where you can come and you can get that extra um, boost if you need to get unstuck from something. Um, but seeing as how we're trying to finish up these story beats, and move into scene cards. I think this week we all sort of know what you'll need to be working on. You'll need to be working on expanding and fleshing out the story beats outline that you have into a full paragraph for every single scene, which basically tells you what, who is the main character of that scene, what are they trying to accomplish, do they get what tactic do they use to, to try to accomplish it, and do they get it or do they not, and what happens as a result. And that is basically just kind of the bullet points that we want in place for every scene. Um, if you can kind of put some of those together in your head without needing to fully explicitly outline each of those things on your paper then go for it and you might just have shorter outlines but you might find that it's helpful to really think those things through and if you are if you're struggling when you actually get to the scenes to to figure out how do I in fact execute this then it may be that you just need to do a much more detailed set of scene cards and I, I've written cards that are up to a page each so it's easy to 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 over or to to plan a lot and to to really like it's it is possible to go too far but you just need to kind of figure out you need to figure out your own method and how much preparation that you need personally some writers will be essentially writing the script just on their google doc on their on their outline sheet and they'll just be and i did this too you'll write out the scene just with no formatting at all just the bare text just press enter every time and just write out the text and then that's easy to edit and move around and then from there i usually copy and paste it into the screenwriting software itself um so that you can kind of do a lot of the fiddling around and just getting the words out in a format that doesn't look so sort of final and set in stone. Okay, so let's look at our um, recap of our process, and um, then we will uh, go over a couple topics for today. So we start with logline, we go to sketchbook, we move to story beats, then we move to scene cards as our fourth step before we go to pages. And writing scene cards for a lot of people is essentially starting to write the script. 
um, because you have to do the heavy lifting of making those decisions and filling in the gaps and making sure that everything kind of connects. We usually should not have an outline that is um, that has gaps in it or that has placeholder scenes or that has moments that are like XXX insert scene here. Um, you can have a couple things like that, you know, insert technical details here, um, insert explanation here, insert conversation here now and again, but usually we should at least know what each conversation is going to be about and what the results are, even if we don't specifically know exactly how we're going to get down, boiled onto the topic that your characters are discussing in that scene yet. Um, so we want to fill out every single card for every scene. So we're going to be marking out a full document using Google Docs is what I use for this, like the same we use for all our pre-writing and outlining. And we're going to not only describe what happens in each scene, but we're going to use this with a, a, in conjunction with marking out our story beats. So we're going to know, for instance, our intro sequence is going to be the first three cards or whatever, and the midpoint is going to be just one card and, and things like this. We also know the page numbers that we anticipate it to take place on, meaning that you're going to have to kind of make some choices and also just some get your, some of your best guesswork as you move through this because almost always you're going to run over your estimated pages and almost always um, your final page count is not going to be exactly what you assumed that it would be at the start until you're doing this for many, many, many years and, and just um, doing a lot of the work of you know figuring out exactly how many pages each moment or each scene would require. But this makes a good time. And in this pre-writing um, moment, in this last week of pre-writing, to go through and you're sort of ascertaining how much space you'll need to, or sorry, you're assessing how much space you'll need for each scene, how much page space and how much story space. And to that end, you can kind of go through and assign importance levels to each scene by giving them more or less room, which is not to say that a one page scene can't be extremely important and a four page scene is always important. But basically, well, I should say actually a four page scene should be extremely important because that's like at the upper limit of the number of pages that you want any one scene to, to take place on, for the most part, with occasional exceptions. Um, so generally, we're starting at one page is like your shortest outlined number of pages for a scene card. Two pages is sort of your standard scene. And you can assume if each scene, you know, we're, if we're just ballparking it, each scene is going to be two to two and a half pages long, more or less if you're just looking at the flat math of it. Um, in practice, it tends to alternate a lot between a, a two-page scene, then a one-page scene, then a three-page scene, then two then one, then three, then two. But usually we're alternating between one, two, and three page long scenes. So as you're going through your scene cards, you must be marking out, this will be page one, this will be pages two to three, this will be page four. And you're just assessing as best you can how much space each of these moments will require. The cheat sheet that I've used in the past before is we start at with assuming that a scene will be one page. Then you assess, does it have lots and lots of talking? Or is there a lot that needs to be discussed? In which case, we add a page. Then you ask, does it have lots of action, like characters moving around and doing physical things in the scene? It doesn't. Action doesn't always just mean, you know, crashing cars together, but action could mean characters moving around and doing research in a library or whatever it is that they're doing, just a lot of moving around and doing stuff. That's going to add a page as well. And the last thing that's going to add an extra page is there's more than two principal characters that need to have important story moments here. So that's four things that we can look at. Each of those is going to add a page, and that sort of tells us that very few scenes should have all of those things. Um, and we need to be mixing up how, like the kinds of action that we're seeing in our scenes and the pace and the tone in order to create that sense of music and rhythm on the page. Like not every scene is just the exact same length. Not every scene goes the same way. And scenes shouldn't generally be ending as we expect them to go. So you're going to have the strongest scenes when they end in some kind of unexpected way that pushes us like or bounces us like that springboard off into your next scene with a sense of energy and momentum and maybe sometimes even like raising a question in one scene that you then seek to further answer in the follow-up scene or you, you raise a question and then you leave it for a while and you sort of promise us we'll come to answer that question later. This idea of setting promises that you then strategically will work towards fulfilling is really at the heart of what we're doing in terms of storytelling. So um, the, uh, the most essential process of writing out the scene cards is in writing out, like determining how many pages the, each of those moments will be and also just you're taking out all the placeholders that you had when it was in the form of a story beats outline. So anything that was in the story beats that you did not have figured out yet, you must now figure out. It's not a complete set of scene cards until you figured out every scene. But this is all really going to help you that so that once you start writing those pages, they're really going to fly out a lot faster and nothing is really set in stone. You always have that freedom to change these things as you're going or to come up with new cool stuff. But we just want to try to not rely on that. We don't want to leave yourself a space where you're like, I don't know, I'll solve that problem when we get to it. 
if there's anything that's blank, it should be, I know exactly what I'm going to do, and I'm going to be playing around in that moment, or I'm going to be figuring out my exact path through that scene. But it should, there shouldn't be moments on there that were like, I have no idea what's going to happen there, because that will just run you into a brick wall really quickly. Uh, okay, so let me... We don't need to quite look at a story beat on a on a board, but we can at least glance at this. This is what, I mean, even modern writers' rooms, a lot of the time they're using projectors and digital documents of some or smart boards or things like that, but some rooms actually do just still use giant whiteboards and giant physical bulletin boards with note cards all over them, or a lot of the time they will have, like, giant, uh, you know, like, um, they'll, they'll put a big box around, like, this is all Act 1, and then they'll sort of fill that in with really tiny writing, and then on another whiteboard they'll have, this is Act 2, and they'll fill that all in. So this physical method of writing things out by hand or having the writer's assistant do it as they're working in the room, this is still very prevalent, so definitely... Um, don't be too surprised if you see this actually in a writer's room someday. But what we're, we're doing for the most part is we are working in just the completely digital space. We don't have to actually use this whole physical setup unless you really want to for some reason. And like when I was in college, I remember I had note cards all over my floor that my roommate had to like step over to get to his bed. Um, and that's how I, I, I have tried this in the past. But I, I think that you, you will find what works best for you. And for most people, you don't really need to use a full wall of actual physical cards. You can do what you need to do, just in that Google Doc format. Um, okay, so let's just glance at some uh, cards. Um, and these are the cards that um, were for this half hour historical dark comedy short um, called Nave that I did a reading of a couple weeks ago for a class. So I'll go ahead and I'll share these in the boot camp chat if you guys just want to take a look and we can go through um what my scene cards look like and what you should i guess mostly be aiming for if you're following along with my method and doing the things that uh, you know trying to approach this in the way that we emphasize here at script camp um so our first page of the scene cards is similar to our first page of the sketchbook just everything is very cleaned up and more finalized so at the top we have the same things we always have we have genre format or in continuity so like time slot and continuity in terms of tv we have um uh, comps and then we have our log lines we have the series log line at the top we have the pilot log line underneath that then below there i have a list of our main characters this is just for myself this is not for anyone else and you should just if you especially if you have a lot of characters you can totally just include like a little list for yourself to keep everything straight um, and then maybe a few minor characters, too, if you want to separate them out, or just say these are characters that will only be in the pilot, but, you know, get eaten by monsters by the end, or whatever it is, then um, just try to list out all the people that will be important so you can keep the dynamics between them and the details of all these different people straight. From then on, we move to our scene cards, and I'm going to bring up the... Uh, the Google document version of this just so you guys can see the outline that I'm building. On the left-hand side of the screen, this is the document outline, and by using Google Docs, you will have this as well. So you can see on the left-hand side here, we can be using the headings. So our heading one is going to give you the biggest heading. That's going to be like a the, the top of an act is what I use for that. Then underneath it, you're going to be using heading two, and that is going to create these sort of subdivisions, which are going to be your individual scenes. Now, each of the scenes has not only pages that it will take place on, but it also has a title. And I find this useful just because it helps you clarify the point of these moments in these scenes. And you might find that if you're drifting too far from that, that you're like, oh, that title doesn't make sense anymore. Then it could be that the focus of the scene has changed. So I just recommend doing this. Um, you don't have to be particularly artful or interesting with these titles. But um, I think that uh, try it out if you haven't tried it before. Um, if you hate it, you don't have to. But just writing out the titles for these scenes as if they are each one is its own little story just might help you keep them straight. And we can really think of scenes as each one is its own sort of little story, sometimes with its own three-act structure to it. <clears throat> so um, the last thing is that you're going to want to be, of course, marking out if you are if your show has a lot of different subplots. You can mark out like, okay, this is the C story, this is the B story, and you can just clarify where do those things begin and where do they conclude. And almost always, I should say, 99% of the time, those are both all your side stories are going to be opened up in your first act, and they're going to close in the reverse order that they were opened in. Because usually they're being opened in order of importance, in descending order of importance, and then they are concluding in ascending order of importance. Meaning that we close your C story, then your B, then your A. 
And you can include bits of dialogue or any other fragments from your sketchbook that you think will just help you help inform the writing of that scene. If you really want to include pictures or things like that, then you can. A map might be a nice idea if you're if the navigation of some kind of physical space is really key to your story. I would put that on the first page if I were you. Um, but you, we, let's check out how long this is. This ended up being, so it's one page for the title and the breakdown, and then eight pages for the rest of the cards. That's what it looks like for me, and we have this very nice, you know, little outline on the left that I recommend building because it lets you just very easily navigate around, see where the gaps are, and see what still needs work. And then when you go to pages, at every day that you work on this, you're going to be highlighting the scenes that you are working on. Green means you finished that scene. And if something still needs work or still needs to be changed or you need to just remark upon for some reason, you would use yellow. So we're using the stoplight system, green, yellow, and red. And if you end up cutting a scene, you're going to want to mark it in red so that you remember that you've cut it and that you know that on your next pass through, you're going to have to, when you're re-outlining, you will delete that scene from the re-outline. <coughs> Okay, um, so any questions about scene cards? How do we how we make this document? How we update this or color code this as we're working through it? If there's no questions, we'll continue to our next slides. Um, maybe I could ask. Do you try to? Do you do this, um, what do you do in terms of like character arc? I know it's a bit different for maybe a TV show, so maybe the question is a little obsolete, but is that something you're noting at this point? The character arcs? Um, well, so those should generally be figured out during the, yeah, we, sh we, should, we should know what those are, and those should be in the scene cards. So yeah, absolutely, that should be woven into the, the document that we have here. Um, and that so means that- highlighted it's less highlighted but more touched on is that what you're saying? yeah or i mean i've i've marked out where the different character subplots are in bold here at least we say this is the b story this is the c story and then at the end when those things conclude i mark in bold where those wrap up as well and almost always that it at least in a small cast show like this this is not really a big ensemble each of these b, the b and c stories are going to relate directly to the main character so it's going to be the main character and this other person so that we understand how that plot, and we're marking, we're marking out in the scene cards how that subplot affected both our main character and the side character. So, yeah, we are definitely marking that stuff out in this. We should be very aware of how the characters are changing through the pilot, and of course, we need to leave them a lot of room to grow because it's a pilot. Okay, thank you. Sure. Other questions? Okay, if there's no more questions, we'll go back to our um, I have a random here. question. Go ahead. Real quick. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, um, when you're, I, I guess this, this happens after you've already fleshed out, like, a beat sheet, I assume, is that what you said? Like, what was the stage before this one, last week? I wasn't here, so I missed it. Yeah, story beats, outline. Story beats, okay, no worries. All right, my, my question is invalid, it's fine. No worries. Thank you. Oh, okay. Sure. Um, all right. Let's look at our next slide here. So common structure problems. I think that overly ambitious structure is one of the most common ones we see where we just have either too many scenes or too many plot points, too many characters, too many subplots, and just too much ground covered. Or it could be a little bit what Lee was sort of running into the week before, which is not so much that there's too many scenes, but just that there's too much going on in the scenes that we have and that the machinations of the plot are just too complicated especially in a short form show um so we gotta just cut real reel it in and cut back as much as we can and um understand that the audience uh can't hold too many plots in their heads at once like three to four is kind of the max number of individual conflicts and storylines that we're going to want to maintain in our brains for the most part in most shows maybe up to five i guess that would be an a b c d in an E story, maybe in a super dense and complicated hour long pilot, but I can't think of how you go beyond that. We only have an hour. And if we imagine that each act in a half hour is 10 pages, that leads you with, leaves you with about five scenes per act. It's about six or seven scenes per act in full hour. And that's just not a ton of time to do everything you want. 
Um, the nice thing is we don't have to complete the story because a pilot, in many ways, is just an incomplete story. Um, it's if, if you're doing a premise show, then it's fundamentally incomplete. If it is a status quo show, we do want it to feel like it has that really strong element of beginning, middle, and end, and that we have seen the first complete chapter of something in which of a world in which there will be many other chapters like this, but they aren't sequential chapters necessarily. We st should still feel like, even though the characters might be going on some kind of gradual longer term arc or something like that that ultimately we're going to come back any week and be able to see a similar adventure using the pieces wherever they've ended up at the end of that pilot um so other problems might be the conflict is too internal like it just seems like your characters are mostly sitting around talking about stuff which is okay to some extent i mean tv is largely about people talking in rooms to each other and i often say if you can't write an incredibly compelling scene of someone's in a room someone else comes to that room they both the characters talk then one person leaves then you're not going to be able to write a good pilot because that's going to that's like what 63 percent of scenes on tv are i'm just making up that number out of completely nowhere and you can have a great show that's almost nothing but people talking in rooms um but also keep in mind that we're, we have the freedom to do other things like you have the freedom to um show your characters leaving just a couple it don't, we don't have to limit their action to just a couple sets like a multi-cam sitcom we can have them get out into the wilderness we can have them we can do flashbacks we can do montages we can do alternate uh, timelines we can do all kinds of things that just kind of break us out of people talking in rooms mode um and there's obviously a lot of different ways that you can break out of that but the point is just try not to you're, you're gonna get this note of your script feels stagnant and stagey or static and stagey stagey meaning it just feels like people standing around or walking very slowly from place to place talking um and we generally want to get them out and doing stuff so remember that plays are about people standing around and talking uh, books are mostly about ideas and m movies and tv shows are about people doing things so make sure your characters are doing visual interesting things and they have goalposts that feel like they can be achieved tangibly meaning that we see that something has been accomplished it's not like an opinion whether or not it's been accomplished and even if it is something that is like a relationship that needs to be mended, then we can add tangible goalposts to that relationship so that we make sure that by the time that that problem is overcome, then it clearly visually has been. Think of something as simple as, you know, two characters need to make amends, they have to hug, they have to shake hands, something that just shows that that relationship has physically and tangibly changed. Um, so yeah, always be thinking in terms of what is my character's tangible goal, and we shouldn't be going more than a couple scenes usually without knowing what your main character is trying to do and why. There can be the occasional moments where we want to leave that mysterious, or maybe your character knows more than the audience does, if we think in terms of Sherlock Holmes style storytelling, where he's like, wait, I've got the answer, and then he runs off and Watson's like, wait, what was the answer? And then three scenes later, he swings in on a rope and was like, that was the answer, obviously. That works sometimes, but if you're not doing that deliberately, then don't make us go too long without knowing what your main character is trying to do or why, or it will seem like a mistake. It will seem like an omission and not like a deliberate choice, and it will just leave us kind of confused. So keep careful track of what your main character needs to do and how close they are in progress towards that payoff. Um, okay, so um, remember that movies and TV shows are more like short stories than anything else it's not a full novel but and if we think of a movie is like a short story right well a pilot is at the longest about half the length of a movie and a half hour pilot is a core is half the length of that so it's a quarter of the length of a movie um so we need to get to the point quickly we need to execute on the things that you promised the show was going to have and going to be about and you need to make sure that the setups are leading to natural payoffs um and that we aren't just left hanging wondering how is that thing going to come back and matter most of all, the most common problem is the story just doesn't get going fast enough. And we are left maybe even seeing the pieces start to click into place at the end of the pilot. And we're like, oh, the central team up just got together at the end of the pilot? What? We don't get to see them actually doing the team up in the pilot? In which case, that's a big mistake. We shouldn't leave the most important and coolest stuff for later episodes because you're just we're not going to get later episodes and no one's going to read more than a pilot. Writing pilots, you have to kind of come to grips with this understanding this idea that there's not going to be more show and and as much as we want it to as much as we can keep working and pitching and one day maybe getting a show you just can't count on that being the case you can't count on getting a multi-hundred million dollar company especially as somebody who has not been deeply broken and deeply entrenched in the system so far so just release that from your expectations and just understand that you're probably not going to get more episodes and you have to put the coolest stuff in the pilot 
We can't leave that off for some imaginary future episode that you're never going to get. Okay, any questions on these common problems? If not, then we will move on to just a couple more. I won't spend way too long on these, and these are mostly for features, but there are still some things that come up in TV shows a lot, and some of the biggest ones from these, this Blacklist Reader um, is going to be... Ooh, here we go. So, um, one is that the script offers a tour of a world, but not a story. And that might be if we're just engaging with your character learn, or, or your character's engaging with the world by just researching about it, or learning about it, or driving around and watching it, or observing it, or like just if we're still explaining the difference between the different types of aliens in your world by halfway through the script before we can understand anything that is to follow, then probably you're just giving us a tour of a world. And we need to actually be engaging in that world, and your character needs to be doing stuff and setting objectives and making progress towards those objectives, and then the, that progress leads to some kind of payoff, whether that is success or failure or anything in between. Um, the important story material is told but not shown is a similar and related note where that's kind of um, the, the same thing, right? Where if it's a tour of a world, let me get that to be the right size. There we go. If it is a tour of a world, that means we are sh telling stuff to the audience, but we're not actually showing those things in motion. And it's the difference between, you know, your characters are stuck on an island by aliens that are keeping them there as an experiment, and we could have one long scene where somebody explains, you know, oh, you can't escape the island because there's a wall of mines, and then there's going to be a bunch of sharks in the water, and then you can't escape from there because there's going to be boats with ray guns on them. Um, it's a difference between that and between having your characters are all together on the island and we just watch somebody try to escape, and we watch them get blown up by mines, and we watch them get blown up by laser guns, and we watch them get blown up by aliens, whatever it is, eaten by sharks, you know. Then we see those things taking place, rather than just talking about them. And by watching them occur, it will actually sell that threat of that moment better or sell the effect of the moment better. Um, protagonist is too passive, obviously. Your main character, especially your, your, your sort of A story character, um, should be very proactive, meaning they're taking active and clear concrete steps towards solving their problems and overcoming their obstacles, meaning they're making goals, they're setting goal posts for themselves, and they are working to try to achieve those um, meaning the story shouldn't feel like it's just happening to them and they're just react reacting to it and they're just a passive uh, a passenger in the narrative. They should, in fact, feel like they are in the driver's seat. Now, I know that over the course of a TV show, there are times in later episodes and on shows that we've watched that we really like where the main character is less proactive or they're in the hospital or anything like this. But for the purposes of the pilot, you want to keep you want to show that you have a strong sense of what does propuls propulsive storytelling look like? And in Western modern style, that means a main character that is very active, that is in charge of the plot, and it's clear why it's about them. If it feels like it could kind of have been about anybody, then it then you you probably haven't chosen the right protagonist, and they aren't invested enough in the events that they're engaging with. Um, other other note things, common problems that you'll see. So narrative falls into lulls or repetition. We see this in second acts all the time where we're just sort of doing the same type of scene again and again. You know, the killer gets away from the cops, he kills again, he gets caught again. Killer gets away from the cops, he kills again, he gets caught again. If we just do that multiple times in the middle, it'll start to wear on us pretty quickly. And we need to be throwing different types of conflicts at your main characters, so they're just not trying to do the same thing in every single scene, and we're not trying to approach those conflicts in the same way in every scene. Um, what else? Uh, coincidences and contrivances that create problems are good. But coincidences that extend problems, um, th th and th those can work too, but the coincidences that solve problems, that is where you're going to run into your, your biggest problem. So we don't want to usually get your characters out of trouble with coincidences or things that they were not directly in control of or directly causing in one way or another, or else it will reveal too strongly what we call the hand of the author, which just means that invisible sense of you, uh, uh, a, an intelligent creator, influencing these decisions of what happens and why. We don't want to feel like that's the case, even though, you know, some to some extent, the the, the fingerprints of what you're doing are over are all over the story. But if it this this is something that really clarifies when it becomes too obvious, and that if you are just shoving the characters where they need to go, and it doesn't feel organic anymore, then you'll start to lose us, and you'll it'll start to feel very artificial, and we'll lose engagement from the readers. 
So try not to overload us on coincidences. Your big free coincidence that you get is going to be that inciting incident. So if anything in the script is a coincidence, inciting incident is fine if it is. But after that, you sort of... And if, if your inciting incident was a big coincidence, then you probably have lost or spent, I should say, a big amount of your sort of, quote, coincidence budget, meaning that we can't really afford way too many more. Um, unless, for instance, your entire script has that as a major theme, like fate and coincidence being like at the center of what you're doing, like a Cullen Brothers movie or something like that. I could see maybe in that case, coincidence would play a larger role. A show like Fargo or a movie like A Serious Man is going to be like, well, we're exploring the idea of coincidence and asking this question of, are these things actually coincidental or is some intelligent creator causing them to happen? Is the devil making them happen? Whatever it is. In which case, that can be a bigger element in your story. But for the most part, we don't want to see major coincidences affecting the plot in a, in a way that helps your character out. It might be that there's a giant tornado at the same time we need to stop the terrorist, which I think happens in Mission Impossible 4. <laughs> but at least it's set up. It's the sandstorm, right? We see, oh, in this place, there are giant sandstorms. So, so that by the time that it actually happens, it doesn't feel as much like a coincidence, even, even though nothing that the characters did caused a storm to occur at that time. But just the fact that we have sort of visually tagged it and we've had the characters remark, oh, we should make sure to finish the mission before that happens. That could happen any time. Then it doesn't feel like a coincidence anymore and you haven't really wasted any from your sort of coincidence budget. Any questions on coincidence and stories? Or anything of the other structural tips that I've talked about? Um, I mean, in terms of a, a coincidence, like... I'm trying to I'm trying to think of how to word this. I'm sorry. I guess like I, I mean I can just give you an example. Like I'm I guess I'm just trying to make it like I have a character who's trying to like uncover a, a sense of mystery by the end of the story. And part of the point was meant to make it that they don't figure out the exact answer to that mystery that they were looking for, but they realized something else instead. So it answers a different truth as opposed to the truth that they thought they needed. Mm -hmm. um, part of the way in which they achieve that is through a bit of a coincidence. It's, But I think part of the point is meant to be like to highlight the arbitrary, like the, the stupidity of the initial thing that they were trying to solve in the first place. I'm not sure if that is something that I should... Is there any, like, things I should be, like, I don't know how to specify this because it's still a little bit, it is a little bit foggy at the moment, but does any of that cause you to think, like, that, should, that I should be wary of anything in that regard, or? Maybe, L let me ask the question, so you're saying is it's a coincidence that helps your main character? Yeah, but it, it comes in, like, a uh, kind of, like, a, a slap in the face, I think, for the character, so it's still happens in a relatively challenging way i'd like to think so mm -hmm. it's not like it's just like here's your solution it's more like look at how much fucking time you wasted you idiot kind of thing it's not like oh everything's fine now it's like you're you've done all of these stupid things and it was this simple kind of thing so does it come um, with a drawback of some kind too or does it come with a new ticking clock being introduced or something like that um it's kind of, it's like, it's really like the end, end, end of the story. So not necessarily in that regard. I don't know how to explain it. Um, if it's the very end, then it may not be as much of a problem if, if, if you're sort of just saying like, this is the last event that we see is some kind of coincidence that mm -hmm. might, be, might be fine. Um, just yeah. with, without, without you elaborating more, it's hard to get too in the weeds on it. But um, generally... G generally though we we if you if there's a coincidence that helps out your main character at all it should come with some other kind of conflict that it furthers or advances right like if we discover oh wait a minute we've had the c criminal arrested this entire time he's been in custody since the very beginning then you need to realize oh crap we arrested the wrong people now we're in huge trouble or something like that right where we are, we are taking that thing that happens that it, it may have helped them in one way but it came with something that is going to add urgency and difficulty for the journey moving forward could you rep could you repeat that example? Sorry, you cut out a little bit on my end. So something about oh, sure. uh, imprisonment. Like if minutes. if we have if it turns out that you know your detectives have caught the criminal already and they they they're like you can stop your search now he's already in custody, then it, like coincidentally we arrested him very early on, then mm -hmm. and 
that should come with a drawback or challenge of some kind. Like, in, in realizing that, we now realize, oh, no, we arrested a lot of the wrong people, and now we're going to be in huge trouble right. unless we let them all out of jail in the next three days or whatever, you know, finish line, oh, whatever okay. tangible consequence there is for that. So, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, I think that works. Go ahead. Yeah, I think that works because I think, yeah, okay, you kind of highlighted to me that the fact that it is highlighting to him that he did something stupid in, re like, learning that, despite the fact that he learned, like, some sort of truth that he really needed. He also simultaneously learned that he wasted his time doing all of these wrong things. Much like you're saying, like, oh, we learned the truth and it was this simple. But I also simultaneously learned that I did, I put all of these wrong people in jail simultaneously. So I, right, yeah, I right. think that works. So, okay, cool. Yeah, I hope that helps. So, yeah, if, if a coincidence is helping us out, then attaching some consequence, some drawback, some negative aspect or some t new ticking clock to it can be the best way to help us use that in the most effective way. Okay, yeah, cool. Okay, cool, because it seems like, yeah, like that idea that, like, it still come, it comes as, like, a, a relief, but also a bit of a slap in the face, I think is a good, like, give and take. Okay, cool. Thank you. Sure. Um, other questions about structure? Any of the points that we've gone over? Yeah, I'm wondering if, um, so in terms of like giving a tour of the world, I've noticed in a number of shows that like there are, if there's any sort of fantasy element, often the show will just tell you straight out what is happening, <laughs> like just in very, you know, very clearly. Um, and I'm just wondering if you have any experience kind of finding the balance there between like it, how how much explaining like how many seconds do you have to explain something before, you know, it's before it's too much, too mm -hmm. much exposition, right? Because like, in like, good in place, like a prologue, obviously, is, is that right? Sorry, go ahead. No, sorry, no. I mean, like in the context of the show. So like, mm -hmm. a like blaring example is the good place where Michael is giving um, Eleanor this tour of the good mm -hmm. place. And it works because it's because of the context. And so it, it lasts for most of the episode that he's giving her an orientation. Mm -hmm. Um but then there are other shows where it's just like a very obvious line from a side character that says, oh, yeah, it's a good thing it works like this. And then they move on and it's, you know, right. it's just like, OK, yep, this is TV for a second, but I'm glad that they told me. Right. Right. Yeah. So good. Good question. How do you balance just exposition if there's fantasy rules, if there's lots of things that we need to know to understand the story? Um, and this is going to come down to the size and scope of the story that you are telling. So half hour, you obviously have half as much or less time than you would have in a full hour to explain things that we need to know. Um, a cold open is often going to be a great spot to hint at what we need to know. And then in the rest of that episode, we're going to come back and explore whatever we saw a bit of in the cold open further. Um, but you can see in like, there's, there's not just one right answer to this. There's, there's a, a spectrum of different amounts of explanation that different types of story worlds need. You need to really be giving us as little as you can in terms of exposition, meaning that sometimes when your characters um, are kind of interacting with and learning about the world and and like in The Good Place You're Right is a good example of this, it doesn't really feel like we're j we are just going on a tour of it. Even though your character is sort of literally going on a tour, it doesn't feel like we're just glancing at stuff as we move through it because your character is sort of interacting with stuff and meeting people and trying things out and getting accustomed to this new world. So I think putting them in the world and having them interacting with it, talking to people, doing stuff, is going to be really key to making that work. Or otherwise, they're demonstrating the rules that we know. Have you watched Pushing Daisies? Uh, I have not. Is that the one I just read? I think uh, I just read the... About the pie maker? Yes, I just read the pilot for that. I haven't oh, watched it. it. Okay, okay. Yes. So, you, so you read the script, so you saw that. That one has a lot of explanation up top as well, right? But yeah. it's because that we need that because the gimmick of how the magic works in that show is key to the entire thing. And that, and also gotcha. just because the show has that sort of storybook f vibe to it, it makes sense for there to be a narrator that can kind of help clarify things for us at the very beginning. And to be like, you know, once upon a time there was a kid who could do this. And these were the rules. And that kind of helps us move to the premise quicker. Um, and it allows us to sort of get to the meat of the show faster in, an, in a more efficient way. And you'll notice that by the time the first act is done, 
we have not only gone through the character's entire sort of relevant, the relevant parts of their backstory. The pie maker, when he was a kid, he lost his dog, and as a result, he learned he could bring things back to life, but only for one minute, or else there's terrible consequences because someone nearby will die if he keeps them along, alive longer for one minute. We see that having clear effect, and he's not just hearing about it. We see his mom dies as a result of it, right? So we're, we're actually seeing these things in action, and the character is interacting with the rules and learning the limitations of them. It's not just him sitting there and going, and by the way, I can't keep someone alive too long or else something really bad <laughs> will happen. Like, we see it. He learns it by it happening to him. Awesome. So it, so it doesn't feel like exposition, even though it I... is. It, and that's the, the fun of that kind of trying the lock sequence. That almost a lot of people, when they start, they're like, how do I skip the trying the locks? That's so boring to just learn about the rules. But no, it's not at all. It should be one of the most fun parts of the whole story. Because we're not just sitting in a classroom taking notes. Your character is trying stuff out and having the rules affect them and they're, they are learning the limitations alongside us and all of that is really going to just sort of give you more room to have more of that explaining type exposition the more that your character is playing around with it oh, really interesting i notice also that in those two examples in the good place and pushing daisies and you mentioned this like it is the exposition has enormous payoff mm-hmm like all of the exposition, all of Michael's talking about how this is this place is full of good people and it's perfect and it's all of that like has enormous payoff at the end of the pilot when Eleanor, you know, confesses that she's not a good person. And then like definitely throughout the rest of the series. And then the same with Pushing Daisies, where it's like the specific mechanics that they made sure to tell us are the thing that breaks your heart at the end of the episode. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, so it's not like there's nothing wasted. There's no like, they're not telling you extraneous details. And it's, yeah, that's right. cool. Thank Good you. Point. So it's basically like there's no hard limit on how much explaining you need to do. The question is just how much fun is it? And the more fun it is, the more room you have to, to indulge in it. Joe Toll in the comments mentioned Harry Potter. Yeah, Harry Potter is really good for this. It makes learning the rules of the world into a really fun part of it. It's not just like, now you're going to sit down, I'm going to tell you all about the different types of magic wands. Harry gets to go to the wand shop and start trying them out. And then he tries the wrong one and it like blows up a book or it blows up an hourglass or whatever it does. And like, he's, he's playing around with it and he's learning the rules alongside us. So we sort of like feel like we are him for the purposes of those sequences. Yeah, I think like the... I, what I love about the, that scene in particular, well, is it's like to, to bounce off what I wrote in the, in the in the comments. It's like I found in that scene, it does as much as it's giving you like answers about all the quote unquote rules of this world. It's also creating like a thousand questions relevant, not just to the characters, uh, particular like what they're going to have to deal with, but also just the potential within this world as well. Like mm -hmm. I love the fact that like there's like. I remember, or particularly, especially when I was younger, when I first watched that scene, it's like, I think the, uh, the, the, the I don't even know what you're calling, the, the owner of that shop, and he's pulling out the one, he's like, I wonder, and you're just like, hmm, what's going on? And he's talking, I think it's got to do with the fact that it's like, a brother one, so, um, and it's just like little things like that, you don't, you don't necessarily get any context to, but it just gives you so much curiosity as, like, what else could go from this place, so it's like, yeah, with every answer, it's like a thousand questions, and I just love that. So it's so cool. Yeah, yeah, and, and fantasy especially really thrives on this sense of wonder, and the sense of wonder comes from not knowing stuff. So you can open up just a lot of questions and just sort of like show little glimpses of stuff to create that mystery and that sense of oh, there's a whole world here that we're only seeing the very surface of it. But like I don't know, Harry mm. Potter's walking around the shops and he sees I don't know. There's a there's a goblin. There's goblins walking around on stilts and the, okay, there's goblins in the world, I guess. And we see there's like an alleyway with a dragon poking its head out, and we're like, oh okay, so there's dragons in the world too. And and so we're sort of just seeing all the kind of crazy stuff this world could contain and, and the series will contain as it moves forward. So yeah, that that sequence is in Diagon Alley is really essential for building that sense of wonder and and, and that the, the sense of wonder that Harry Potter really operates on as its bread and butter. Um, especially in those first couple books where we are sort of just inch, inch by inch, we are stepping into this world. It doesn't just drop you into the middle of it and just let leave you to fend for yourself and figure out what's going on. It's not Malazan. You know, Malazan is a book series that just drops you in the middle, or like Dune, for instance. Dune is just like, oh my God, all these rules, all these terms, all these things. But Harry mm -hmm. Potter is so popular because it's so easy 
to just track step by step. We we don't know more than the main character does, and he's just a kid, so he needs to learn things right. like a kid would. And kids like to learn things in fun, hands-on, tactile, and interactive ways. It's funny you mentioned June because I found in the movie, as much as I liked a lot of what was going on in it, it did feel a little bit just like, here's all the rules of this world. I'm going to tell you everything exposition-wise about the story. And I do remember, like, every now and then there were some scenes where it, like, would set up things later. But it felt like, I remember, like, there was that scene where, they're, like, they're introducing, like, the worms that would be in the sand. It, they're literally just, like, telling him. He's almost just reading it. Like, it's like, well, this is, like, he's learning about it. And it kind of was, like, it kind of annoyed me a little bit because they were straight up telling me, that, like, the scale of these things. Like, like, so when it happened later in the story, it didn't really come to any shock at the scale. Mm-hmm. And so it, I felt like they probably could have done it where they hinted at it, but not necessarily have told me every little bit of information about what this yeah. thing could have been. That's a good point. And like, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, sorry, yeah, no, you have a, I was going to bounce onto a different point, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I was, I was going to comment on maybe, have you seen Pirates of the Caribbean, those movies, the way that they handle the sea monster, the Kraken in the second movie, really good job of kind of concealing the true scale of it until it has that big awesome scene. So I think that that's sort of the opposite of what you're right. you're saying. If we, if we just kind of explain everything about it beforehand, then we know exactly what we're in for. But if you just show, like, just a tentacle at first, or just, like, a hint of a dark right. shape moving underwater, that by the time we fully... We're, like, getting scared of it, and by the time that it, it finally shows up, then we are in awe of it because we have, you know... Uh, we've created this sense of what it could be like in our minds. Yeah, well, we've created an expectation, right? And then when it, it is manages to... Tr- we already are expecting it to be terrifying, but when it transcends that, it's, like, even more effective. Right. Like, yeah. I think... um. To, to bounce off that point and to go back to Harry Potter momentarily, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this because I just thought about it then. Like, Harry Potter, I think one of the reasons why it does this so effectively is it does set up for things in a way that you don't even realize it's setting it up. Mm-hmm. And I didn't just realize this until just just then where I was thinking about that one scene. I was like, there are just the tiniest little things that they hint at. It's like, we don't really know that Quidditch is possible within this world but we walk past a broomstick as he's walking down and you don't know that that's later going to come into effect much like Hedwig we don't know the scale of that we just think it's a cool little thing but it obviously comes back later Mm -hmm. there's also like unicorn hair he's talking about that's in the the wand and then later in the story we actually see a freaking unicorn like that has the blood and all of this stuff it's like they just do such a good job of setting up the potential for like or making your mind in some sense say like Ooh, I wonder like where that what that could do, and then they explore those possibilities in really interesting ways that you weren't expecting. Yeah, so, yeah, that's cool. It's the equivalent of in in virtual reality games. I think that some of the most effective like tutorial sequences are the ones that don't actually fully give away what you're going to be doing later in the game. So you'll have like a sequence where your character gets like a dart gun, and it's like here, use this dart gun, and you try it out, and you sort of learn how to shoot a gun in the game. And then later in the game, somebody throws you a big revolver, and they're like, here, use this revolver. And you're like, oh, crap, I get to use that skill that I used before, and I know how to now do it. But I'm using it in a different context where it's suddenly awesome because it comes with that element of surprise and also familiarity. Yeah, I we I saw a vid- Now that you sent me um, that, uh, uh, we both, I think you, and I, we've seen the um, Lessons from the Screenplay videos mm-hmm. on YouTube. And he has a different channel but i think this video is actually in the lessons of the screenplay but i think story world is the youtube channel but he talks about like games and there's a video game that he broke down i think it's the star wars one it's like the redhead kid it's ps3 or something like that or four yeah i don't i haven't played it but one of the ways in which they make Follow the it. exposition yeah uh one of the ways in which they make the exposition and uh, the tutorial moments of the story engaging is that they put it within backstory, which is really cool because you're learning about the character simultaneously learning about the potentials of the world and the um, skills of the character, which is really cool. Mm-hmm. The, I thought that was worth noting as well. It's like that can be applied Definitely. within the story as well. Definitely. Yeah. Any, anyway, any, any time that, that we're doing two things at once in a scene... Yes. And that, if that's like we're learning about the backstory and we're learning the main mechanics, for instance, right. just in those scenes, then that's going to be stronger almost by default. It's If you do one of them badly, it obviously isn't always going to be a better scene. 
but it's almost always going to be a good sign if you're able to effectively juggle two separate objectives at once in a, in any given scene. That's just a structure note for no matter what you're writing. The original Matrix does that does that really well as well. The first one particularly, it's like for that sure. that scene where he's like literally as he's learning about as much as as much as we get that huge exposition scene of learning what the Matrix is. There's two ways that it, that they get away with it. Is in some sense they create so many questions for like the setup of the story that when it comes time to learning about the Matrix, like you can't wait to get that answer and this is what you've wanted to hear. Mm -hmm. But it's also done through like as he's learning the potential of like he learns karate at the same time. Like he's actually doing it. It's like you can jump like buildings. He's actually doing it. It's like yeah. instead of someone just telling him or watching him like act it out, which is really cool. Yeah, the, I'll keep on the that thing. whole sequence in the Matrix is one of the most fun sequences in all of movies, and it's like, yeah, because it feels like you're playing the first few levels of an awesome video game where we've seen what is possible, some hints of what is possible in the world, and now we're getting to play around with it for the first time. So that's why that's just one of the best sequences ever. Yeah, and I just thought about the fact that that whole movie is, in some sense, just an accumulation of just like him slowly but surely unlocking every skill. Like possible in that like quote unquote game. game. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. That's a good plan. Cool. I love the Matrix. Um, okay, let's uh let's look a little bit at um I feel like we've done have we done enough structure? Let me just open the floor and see what are you guys still wondering, working on or struggling with in terms of your story beats outline and moving that into scene cards. We can take a look at some outlines right now and give specific feedback if you guys need, or we can just open it up to questions and just try to solve problems that pertain to your pilots. So let's open the floor and see what would you guys like to hear about or discuss or work on in your own scripts. Let's go down the list. Let's start with Dan. How's your script going, Dan, the pilot? Uh, which one are we going to talk about here? Aren't you writing just one pilot about the space fighters? Yeah, the pilot script. Um, uh, I did a revamp, but I shared it in a, one of the groups. And now I've been, now I've just been kind of stuck. Stuck? Why stuck? Because I've been trying to redo a big, a, like the first introductory scene, because everyone was saying it wasn't very effective. So I'm just trying to think, how can I make, how can I endear people to that? We read, I think I read, we read the scene in one of the things, and then I read it again at like animation group. So I'm just trying to think, what can I, I don't know. So you finished the first, the entire draft is done, and now you're just trying to, you're on a rewrite. Is that correct? I hadn't finished the well. Yeah, I had finished the entire draft before, but then I went and shared it, and then now I'm thinking, okay, this starting scene. I thought it was okay. I thought the dialogue was good. The characters had a connection, but I guess it's just not effective. It doesn't show the character doing any uh, working towards his goal, hmm. which I'm just not sure how to do because it's sort of like saying. It's showing what he does as an individual or what he doesn't do, and that's take his work seriously. Does it end in an unexpected way, would you say? Well, it ends with him having an angry phone call from his father who's going to wind up dead soon enough. That's right. That's the opening scene? I thought the opening scene was a battle of some kind. Oh, no, no, that's not the scene that had me worried. It's the scene after. That's the cold open. I was talking oh. more about the... Uh, okay actual first scene that's like this is where we get to know our character right 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 okay well we could take another look at it in class today i mean we were looking more at pilots in progress where uh, it sounds like hold on I, more of a rewrite for you yeah case, well we i actually well, let me see if i could i don't want to hold up too much time on it because i'm actually had some ideas and i wanted to write it out first and then see what people thought Okay. Okay. That's that's fine too. We just want to help you in whatever way you need. So we're happy. I'm happy to just give suggestions, or we could look at the actual scene, or if you have like a specific question that you think that you could articulate that might help you, what would help you the most? Well, I'm trying to make it so that people can see that this per to get the. Uh, I'm not even trying to articulate the words. 
but I kind of just want my character to seem uh, not sympathetic, but somebody that we want to see go on an adventure. We want to see them grow, despite the fact that they are lazy, they're unmotivated. They are, they've got, it's like they're broken. They're a broken person, which, okay, to be fair, most characters are broken, but in some way, shape, or form, but I'm not very good at ex expressing it. He's got a, a strange uh, relationship with his world famous father, mm -hmm. who isn't really giving him a, who isn't, and it's causing all kinds of daddy issues. Mm -hmm. And so I guess we would ask the question, and and like like we we don't have to go way too deep into the scene if you feel like you already have some ideas how to fix it. But I'll just let me just ask these questions to see if this helps at all. Um, your main character is a lazy good for nothing it would seem right so is it that he doesn't care about his job it's not that he doesn't care he's one of those lazy you know he's one of those uh you know those kinds of people who are like lazy but really talented at the thing they do i see okay so he's so sort of... lazy that he's actually a drunk and he still manages to fly a plane okay so that's an interesting basis for a scene, definitely, and something we want to establish about the character early on. And I think that if you do establish that properly for your main character, then we will Perhaps root for someone I was someone actually like that. thinking instead of him starting out in his room with his friend being a drunk, lazy putz, not paying attention, I was thinking maybe I have an opening scene where we do see him flying in a training simulation, and he's and he's killing it. He's a little wobbly, so you wonder, why is he wobbling? But you see that he is crushing the event. He is crushing his assignment. And then he gets out of the plane, he just doesn't feel anything. And then all the other students cheer. He smiles at that, which I want to try and indicate that he craves attention. OK. I think this might be the And right then path. Okay, go ahead. He passes out he passes out barfing tiss drunk. <laughs> okay. And oh yeah, so I could see that this is a stronger basis for an opening scene where our characters aren't just standing around and talking, but you're actually interacting with the world and we're showing we're demonstrating that he is he may be a drunk. He may be uh, he may seem lazy, but he it's he only seems that way because he is really talented. I think that is something that if you can make some other character come to understand that about him too, then we as an audience might come to understand that about him. I mean, like... Well, he's not like the most hated person in the entire world. Right. True. But at the same time, so if you can show just exactly what you just explained, if you can demonstrate, you know, um, maybe there's like a uh, one of his superiors is, is like calling him while he's in the training simulator and is like, hey, your blood ox your blood alcohol level is at 10 times the limit that it's supposed to be. You need to land the plane now. And he's like, just a minute, I, I almost got this. I've almost blown up the last drones. And like, they're like, you need to stop flying the plane. We can, you're going to crash it. He's like, no, I got this. It might be a fun basis for the scene if we're watching that, if we're watching him demonstrate his skills. I was going to try and do it without dialogue, actually. Maybe that, w that could work as well. But um, yeah, I think you have the right idea. That's the right path to go down is your character is actually doing stuff and showcasing these things about himself rather than just sitting in one place and talking to him. Does that seem like it might work? Right, I'm going to try that out. Thank you. Yeah, sure. I think that would be a lot of fun. I think we, re we really like characters like that. There's no reason a character like that should be disliked. That's your sort of, your Han Solo or any of your kind of just, you know, cocky sci-fi characters. We, we love rooting for that. And um, we also like to see it backfire on them sometimes and to sort of keep them humble as well. Um, so oh, and he, he needs to have a conversation with his father. Sure. Because this is going to be the one and only time he speaks to him. Right. Because his father is going to wind up betrayed and killed. That's right. That's right. Okay. So, um, yeah, let's give that a try. See if that works out and makes your opening scene really pop a lot more. And let us know if that fixes it in your mind. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Let's check with um, Joel. Joel, are you writing a pilot at the moment? Uh, complicated question. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to appear, um, I'm sort of popping in and out of different people's classes and stuff. Um, but I'm not writing per se at the moment, uh, but I can talk about my pilot. I've been working on it for 
Oh, about a year on and off. Um, okay. And so, over that time, I've had a lot of different ideas, and things have changed, and, you know, characters have, you know, everything's changed pretty much from when I first started thinking about it. Um, and so, I'm, I guess I need to kind of stop and think about which ideas do I like, which ideas do I, you know, want to throw out or move around or, you know, whatever. Uh, so that's where I am at the moment, just trying to figure out what works in the story. Um, who is my main character, actually? Because I had a main character, and then... But when I started to be kind of the first character of... Because it's like a group of main characters, uh, sort of like, I don't know, Grey's Anatomy or... Not Grey's Anatomy, but, you know, one of those, or, you know... We are following multiple characters. Right. Um, and so I was... I had one main, main character. Um, and then I introduced a different one because I thought, oh, I've not characterised this person enough. Um, you know, this person... I need to build up this character, basically. Um, and so now it seems like they're the main character. And so, yeah, I, I'm just trying to figure out who, which, which character is more important, which character has which backstory, all of that sort of thing. Right. Okay, well, I'm happy to help however I can. I mean, I'm not sure if you have a full set of scene cards or story beats or, or sketchbooks or any or log lines or these things. Um, if you do have any of those, I'm glad to review them if you want right now, or um, if you have any questions that you think might get you unstuck or might just help you move forward. Is there anything that would help you at the moment? Uh, not at the moment, because, uh, like I say, I, it's the first project I ever started working on. And I was trying a different uh, software and stuff. So I've got a bit on Google Docs, I've got a bit on various other software. And so okay. I need to, you know, sort of compile it all into one place. Right, right. Um, okay, maybe for our next, um, yeah, feel free to come to our next TV boot camp, which will be starting in three weeks. Um, maybe going through step by step will help you kind of get it organized. Yeah, I mean, yeah, important because I've got a lot of, you know, I'm doing a lot of different things, so writing sort of a lower priority. But yeah, I do want to get it finished at some point. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, let me know how I can help. Thanks, Joel. Um, Joe Chul said he's not writing a pilot. Um, Let's check with Lee. So, any last questions on structure? Things that you're struggling with on your pilot or trying to get on track that we can address now? I think I'm I'm always trying to get my head around act outs. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I feel like I'm, I tend to pull back from hitting those as hard as I should. Um, and I wanna work on writing scenes that that do leave the audience wondering, you know, what is going to happen next for right. the reader in this case, if it's not produced right, right like right, right. how could they possibly get out of this situation? And um, so I'm trying to push myself farther in that direction, especially with, with physical comedy, especially with sitcoms, just kind of getting out of my like more mellow <laughs> uh, inclinations and, and getting more into like, um, yeah, act outs are like when basically when they break to commercial, um, in television and so yeah finding cliffhangers and maybe do some some practice some exercises in just like generating cliffhangers that i don't want to use so that maybe i can find some that i do want to use you know yeah yeah we can talk about this a bit because i um was giving a, just a little feedback on your outline earlier today and at first i was like wait where's the break into three because and, and the, the confusing thing about especially half hour pilot writing is that there's sort of two breaks into three right there's the the commercial break at the end of act two where we say end of act two and then act three begins on page like 21 or 22 and then there <laughs> is the sort of if we look at just three act structure your characters kind of quote break into three in terms of that character's arc is sometime in some in some versions of this it is like page 24 or 25 or something like that now some oh, maybe gotcha. maybe some older scripts would use um the 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 our, our act, our, the, sometimes they were one and the same and like the break into three was sort of both the structural one and also the characters one 
Um, but don't don't worry way too, way too much about that. The important asp or the important thing to take away from that though is that just the end of Act Two, where we write end of Act Two on page twenty or twenty one or maybe twenty two, is that needs to be a cliffhanger that that makes us need to come back uh, at, after this is done to see what unfolds or what occurs. And to that end, I think you right now for you that's just like your characters get fired. Is that right? Yeah, pretty much. So usually a stronger, if, if it seems like they're fired, that seems like the story is basically over, right? Unless they're somehow able right. to convince the client to get their jobs back. Um, but it might right. seem more like a stronger kind of cliffhanger. I have to come back to see how, how this plays out. If, for instance, I don't know, they burst a pipe and it sprays all over the wall and they're like, oh, crap, the client's yeah. on the way home. Right. Because then it's awesome. not going to be like the job's over. We might as well just pack up and leave. Like, why would I keep watching this episode? It's more like. Uh, it seems that we're on the verge of now failing because something so disastrous has happened that I have no idea how they're going to pull this off. Right. So awesome. That's, I might rethink your act, your page 20-ish kind of region like that and make sure you give us that really strong springboard that will um, allow us to, you know, bounce into the next act with energy and momentum. And we're like, once we go to commercial, we're like, ah, oh, crap. Like, we want the audience to be a little sad that we went to, <laughs> that we went to commercial. We want them to be a little upset because we're like, oh, no, I need to see. I needed to see that. I needed to see, like we're trying to create anticipation and and that sense of like um, there's no way they're going to get out of this one. Is there? Yeah, it's so it's making me think of like the in, in horror and comedy where you you're building and breaking tension mm -hmm. um, over and over again. And so it it sounds like when you go to commercial, you want it to actually be at the height of tension. You don't want to com complete one of those arcs. Yeah, and then exactly. cut to commercial. You want it actually like in the middle of. Does it? I've seen it. I think I've seen it happen in the middle of the scene, often, where like you come back from commercial and it's the same moment, or it's like. Oh yeah, yeah, we can do that. Where it it cool. would be like. Um, it's we, moments later, or yeah, it's... we end on some kind of cliffhanger, and then we come back. And sometimes in some older shows, they would even sort of recap like the last thing that happened, wouldn't they? Where they'd be like, yeah. "Oh no." <laughs> Um, Jimmy's gonna fall down the well. Go to commercial. We come back and we're like, Jimmy's <laughs> on the edge of the well. <laughs> like we sort of like that. That is so ancient. I don't even know if any shows do that anymore. But um, you could, that feels a little like it's coming from the world of like stage. Like when a when a stage show would end its first act and the second act would begin. Sometimes you have a couple lines that just remind us where we are and what's going on. Nowadays we don't really right. do, do that as much. But yeah, you're right. You can you can end in a moment and then return at the end to sort of conclude that moment. It should still feel like that first scene has, like, uh, it, it, it should feel like that 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 cliffhanger is the. It, it, I guess it shouldn't feel like we've split a scene in half. Is the only thing, like, okay. it, it it can still it can be in that same space or that same moment, but it should still be like this first part of this conflict has definitively ended. Now this is the sequel to that last part of the conflict. It shouldn't feel like gotcha. we're, ha we're halfway through something important. That it just feels a little cheaty if you if you leave us on cliffhangers, especially if it's like we open the door, cut to commercial, we don't even see what's on the other side. That's like the moment hasn't right. ended yet. It, a better version of that is we open the door. Oh my gosh, there's a red present sitting on the doorstep, and there's a key hanging on off a tag on the side, and we're like, what does that mean? But then it ends, and we're like, oh, that moment is over. It's not like we've split a moment in the middle for dramatic effect. Awesome, thank you. Sure, sure. I hope that's helpful just in thinking of act breaks and thinking how to maintain that tension. Leaving us with a question is going to be stronger than leaving us with that sense of, wait, that wasn't done yet. That that didn't finish yet. Um, I'm, awesome. That, that's the, the difference between unsatisfying and satisfying cliffhanger. Always, Thank you. I always found the like, X Factor or The Voice or like Idol or any of those like singing shows or talent shows they always do that where it's like they'll like yeah. really pump up the fact that there's like gonna be a person who's about to go on stage and then it cuts to commercial right as you're about to see them or I right as they're that. about to score it. <laughs> yeah, they, they're just as they're about to score it. They're like, all right, what do you guys think? This is the voice. You're like, fuck. <laughs> yeah, re reality shows yeah. And, and competition shows are the absolute worst at this. And, and fans of the genre <laughs> obviously don't care that much. But... but clearly if you're not super into that type of show that grates on you so quickly because it just feels like what does it feel like it feels like we're dragging out the drama doesn't it and that's what yeah, those, exactly. those singing shows are all about dragging out the drama it'll be like <clears throat> one perform one two minute song and like 12 minutes of 
and this is where they were raised in the in the in the rural Kentucky wilderness, and they spent their whole childhood doing this, and they got this disease, and their parents were like this. And then it takes so long to get to the song, and then before the song begins, cut to commercial. We'll see you in the next. We'll, we'll see you after the commercial break. It's so frustrating, and we we want to avoid that feeling for narrative whenever possible. I will say, I will say though, one of the things that I've realized is like. I, it is cheesy and it's really freaking annoying, but I do understand why they do it. Like every single singer or person who's about to do an act, right? Even if it's the goofiest thing ever, they'll go into like this, as you said, like five, ten minute monologue of just like why this thing is the most important thing to them and like what will happen and like all of the stuff, right? It's like it's oh, there's there's always like a person's like friend has died or they've just, they've got some sort of injury or mental health issue going on. They're never just a normal person. But I think what it does do is it does manage to emphasize those stakes, which is, I think, what a lot of those moments tend to be, like, emphasized by. I, w I, would, I was going to ask, uh, those moments, it seems like you also, not only are you trying to, uh, I guess, create, like, a really interesting question with, like, a cliffhanger and, and also, like, end at the height of drama, but that seems to be emphasized by the stakes not just externally, but potentially internally to your character. Is that a good way of thinking about it, or is the? I, I mean, it's a bit broad in the way I said that. But yeah, maybe re can you re way? rephrase that just a little bit so the the stakes of the character go ahead. I guess it's just like for me, it's like like having a character like be about to fall off a cliff never mm -hmm. really piqued me all that much. Like I know the term is cliffhanger, but it's like. When it's just some random character at a random cliff about to die, it's not all that interesting to me. But when I get context to this being like, it's not a literal cliff to this person, because I think it's more like why that doesn't resonate with me. It's purely external stakes. But when it's like the edge of a cliff for a particular character, and there's, it's like their cliff, the equivalent of like a cliff okay. being designed for a character, it's like... This is their journey. This is their plot. Like this is the thing that's going to be an obstacle specifically to them, right? Because it's specifically yeah. attacking them. That seems to be the thing that really resonates with me. Like I go like, oh, okay, this is super important to them. It's not just anyone who is in this position would be suffering. It's like this is like at the height of drama for them. So mm -hmm. I was curious. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Um, yeah. So the it. In order for it to be an effective cliffhanger, it needs to feel like something important is about to happen or could potentially happen. The things that will feel important are the things that matter to your characters, because the things that matter to your characters are the things that will come to matter to us, as long as the things that they want and care about are somewhat relatable and, and fascinating to us, and it doesn't take a lot for that to be true. So, yeah, you have to find the things that matter for that character, and those will make those really effective moments of tension and, and cliffhanger, because A... We know that this thing would affect that person a lot and we have clear evidence of how or we know exactly how it would affect them to have that negative consequence fall on them. And B, it has to be something that we believe could happen. And I think that that's also where we fall in this kind of like um, lame He-Man 80s cartoon cliffhangers where it's like the bad guys have them at the edge of an actual cliff with swords. Oh no, how is He-Man going to get out of this one? Well, he does. It's not that hard. I mean, he, we come back from the commercial. He fights the bad guys and he wins and it's not like they're ever going to kill He-Man. So we lose that element of tension because we're like, I don't believe that the consequences are real or the stakes are not actually substantial. They're not really going to come to pass. So that's how certain shows really will... Well, that's why certain shows will really go the extra mile to show you, no, bad things will happen to your favorite characters in this show. And then when we get to those really tense cliffhangers in your Game of Thrones or your Outlander or whatever it is that has, like, we do horrible things to all the characters, Walking Dead, like, all these shows like this... Um, then we are more worried and more invested because we see it's not an idle threat. It's something that could actually legitimately happen to the character and these people that we care about. Um, but whether it's life or death or whether it's any other set of stakes, yeah, we got to pick the thing that matters for that person. And whatever we have established in the short runtime that we have with this imaginary person, we have to make it clear what matters to them and what affects them. Can I can I run a quick thought by you and see if you what your thoughts on it? Cause yeah. In relevance to that, mm -hmm. I am. Um, I was just thinking, like, when we were talking about, like, um, act outs, I hadn't heard of that term before as opposed to act breaks, and so I thought that was in reference to, as you were sort of saying, within the structure of the story, right? So it's a break into two or a break into three. Mm -hmm. I am curious, because 
where I was trying to find relevance to those two places and why they might have the same sort of terminology, I was trying to think of like where they might structurally have similarities. And I think I just realized like you were talking about He Man for an example, one of the things that tends to happen is that there's a lack of believability surrounding the stakes of what's about to happen to this character. But I think one of the things now that I'm thinking about it that is just as important as a good good cliffhanger is actually coming back into into that scene, like at the start, also in a way that like actually transcends again like that, that expectation or like actually fulfills the promise that it was making to you in that act break in some way where it's satisfying because I remember in those shows whenever I watched them it was always like it was a cheap cop out right it was like if He Man is at the edge of a cliff right and you know all of a sudden while you're like waiting oh my god what's going to happen and then when it comes back to the show and he just pulls himself back up and starts fighting again it's like well, that didn't really feel all that satisfying. It was a waste of time. Why am I watching this? So that's one thing that I thought was really interesting. The other, I think, is like in those breaking before the break into two and before the break into three. I've noticed that structurally, those moments seem to be a choice that the character makes. It's like there's a reason why they have to make the choice, right? It's like they're at a crossroads, and that's usually because the stakes are so high that they have to make a choice to either maintain the status quo in some way or change and so I think what I realized around like the break into two it tends to be an external change where it's like the character decides to go on the adventure right that's mm -hmm. the change I'm no longer staying here in this way of being physically yep. I'm gonna go out and do something different the break into three tends to be where the character usually undergoes a sort of downfall internally uh, because the story has pushed them to a place of vulnerability, and it's an internal change that they make around the break into three. Mm -hmm. That's the choice they make. And so I find it really yeah. interesting that that could also be applied to the ten. I'm curious if you think this, but like around that same moment for like an ad break, for example, it seems like you could apply the same sort of thing where you get the characters up to a place where they're like at the heights of their stakes before the actual ad break, have the break for the ad. And then when you come back, it's a matter of them making that choice, potentially, that makes it interesting. Is that something that you would say yeah, would work? Yeah, you, you can do it like that. Um, or sometimes it works better where we see, like, for instance, um, like, uh, they're like, I have my plan. And then, or like, I know what I need to do. They get in the car and they drive away and everyone's like, wait, where are you going? And they're like, I'm on my way to do the thing. We, don't, we may not know what they've chosen yet, or we may not know what exactly is going to be involved in their plan yet. But just seeing that they've made that choice and we're sort of left in suspense uh, of, oh, God, what's going to happen now can work as well. Um, but you, you can right, also do the right. thing you've mentioned. Like, there's no there's not one exact right way to do it. But I think that's a good point that the the, the first act, the, our break into two, is almost always going to be a physical change of some kind. And then the break into three is going to be that character making that internal or mental change. That might also come with some kind of physical change attached to it if it's an action adventure based story. Mm -hmm. um, if it's not, then it may not need to. But it's going to show them changing their mindset and also doing something that they never would have done if the story didn't happen. That's a really good point. I didn't think about like the plan, and I've always thought about the break into two, like kind of that moment is well, the triangle lox is almost like saying this is the that's like the equivalent in like a heist film where it's like they're sitting around and saying this is what we're about to do, and then the break into the, or this is what we think we should do and mm -hmm. we're going to do. And then the break into two is literally them choosing to go ahead and doing it. And then the second act, those premise scenes are them doing the thing that we want to see. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point because if you, it seems like, and I think you're right actually, it's like instead of waiting for the, act, for the end of the, uh, the ad to then make, have them make the choice, another way is just tell us the choice that they've made and then you can just go straight into them acting out that thing the second you get back to the ad. Yeah. Okay, cool. I think Very that. rarely should we have a scene where a character says, I'm going to do this, and then they go and do that, and it plays out the exact way that they said it would. Right. Almost always you can cut a little bit ahead to them already in the middle of doing that, or about to do that, or something like that that just r r removes the need for us to talk over the plan and then watch them execute that same plan. Occasional, mm -hmm. Very rarely there's moments where that, where that works, but especially you mentioned Heist, especially in Heist, then a mm -hmm. lot of the fun is... They're like, all right, we have to rob the bank, then we fade up in the next act, and they're in the middle of the heist. Something goes wrong, and it seems like it's all over, but wait, that was part of their plan. That was actually, right. they were supposed to get caught, and the driver pulls off his mask, and he was 
a member of their team the whole time. And like part of the fun is we're like, oh, that makes sense. And I see how that all fell into place without having to watch them discuss every step and then do every step. Part of the fun be- becomes that our heroes have surprised us, the audience. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I saw a really interesting video of like just all the Mission Impossibles where this happens, right? Like right before Tom Cruise has to go do the thing, it's like they talk about exactly what they think is going to happen, right? The expectation, essentially, and then that gets diverted in some way yeah. as they're doing. Okay. If we if That's we cool. show the plan, something's going to go wrong in the plan. <laughs> yeah, if you don't show the plan, it's probably yeah right. Okay, yeah, it's interesting. Mm-hmm. I saw that. Okay, cool. I'll think about that stuff. But I just sure, thought sure. that was an interesting way of thinking about it. Run by it. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Good questions. Good discussion. Let's see if we have a couple more slides I want to get to, and then we will just sort of reopen the floor if we need. Um, so. I mentioned this weird stuff, and I know this is kind of that. I'm going to put like a little icon around this section of the uh, half hour pilot, just because this is such strange territory, considering that. And I might even reformat this um, structure diagram at some point for half hour, just because we have that weird thing of like, okay, our break into three is page 20, but then sometimes it's like we don't actually get to your character's break into three until the end of the pit of despair. Like, tw- it could be page 25. Um, and that, this is just, I'm going to call it like the tricky caverns or what do we call it? The, the tricky rivers of the script is going to be moving from act two to three of a half hour show. There's not one right way to do it. It might be like your all is lost moment is the end of act two, or it, that is just such a strong cliffhanger that that ends up feeling like an all is lost moment. That's okay. You can definitely do that. Although it is helpful if it feels like there's a little time to, t- um, space to go. And that things are going to get worse. And we like I just, we were just talking with Lee about her pilot. And instead of your character gets fired, something bad happens that seems like, oh, crap. Now I have, I'm have i definitely going to get fired because there's no way I can fix this. So you may not want to hit them with the worst possible thing has happened yet. But it should feel like it's on the verge of happening or it has become inevitable or unavoidable. What section was that, sorry, Connor? That's just moving from Act 2 to 3 of a half-hour pilot. Okay, yeah, cool, thanks. A lot of confusion there just because there's a lot of different ways of doing that and shows 10 20 years ago weren't always even doing it the same way that they're doing it now and it's just it's like my one diagram that you could make just couldn't cover all the possible ways that you handle that part of half hour pilot structure i would need to have several different diagrams that show you could do it like this you could do it like this so don't worry way too much if that if your section there doesn't feel like it matches exactly to these beats here um, we want to have a strong end of Act 2, which might feel like all is lost. It might feel like, you know, the worst is about to come. Act 3 might open up in the pit of despair, and your character sort of breaks out of that around page, I don't know, 22 or 23 or something like that. And that'll give us enough time for a substantial finale. That'll be like, you know, four or five pages. Then we have maybe, um, you know, two pages at the end for a stinger, or one one or two pages at the end for a stinger. This looks a little bit different to, like, yeah, that. So, like... Here the escalation is is where it cuts into the third act. Mm-hmm. And in the next one, it's more the pit of despair. The pit of despair section makes a bit more sense to me in terms of breaking into the third act. Mm-hmm. Purely because it's usually when your character hits like a low moment that they get vulnerable enough to like latch onto the truth right. um, and then change. But I'm curious, is there, is this just, like, arbitrary things I'm worrying about here, or is there a reason for that at this point? I guess just what I'm saying, and what I'm trying to clarify here, is that there's many different ways to pull off this moment in the, in moving from Act 2 to 3 in half-hour structure, Mm -hmm. Um, and this is just one way. Another way is this way where our, our sort of, all is lost comes directly after Escalation, and it's like page 20. And then we res- mm-hmm. we come back into Act Three already in the pit of despair, or you know, a pit of despair is going to be like twenty one to twenty three or something like that. That's another possible way of doing it. So yeah, there's no right or wrong. There's just you got to pick the version of your half hour structure that works the best for you, and that leads to the best half hour story. Cool. Thank you. Sure. Sure. Um, okay. So we've talked a lot about structure today. Um, we. I don't think need to go too into cold opens. Maybe we'll just go a little bit into scenes, perhaps. Um, and we could talk discovery and conflict scenes. We could talk just what makes good scenes and how to fit them all, fit them together. Um, and uh, we could just talk about yeah elements of scene craft and scene work in our last twenty minutes. But I first want to just open to questions. 
and see if there's anything we haven't gotten to or that you guys are still wondering about before I just go into the topic of scenes. I've spoken a fair bit in the last like 10, 15 minutes, but I was curious if you could quickly like just like one or two minutes of just noting cold, cold opens because I I was, we've I've been getting caught on like a couple of those, um in the last couple of days. I'm just curious to see what your approach is to them really really quickly if you could. Sure. Okay. So cold open. You don't need one. A show does not need a cold open, and I don't usually write them. Um, but you can have one, and in a half hour, they should be basically one or two pages, and in a full hour, they should be two or three. I've seen maybe up to four or five at the absolute most for hour-long shows. Um, basically, this is a time to give us like a mini preview of what the show is going to be like. Um, so if it's a comedy, your cold open should definitely be funny and end on something funny that tells us this is the tone that you're getting into. So if you have some specific flavor of comedy, if your show is going to be a dark comedy or something, then we want to end our cold open on a beat that promises that sort of tone moving forward. Um, or if it's going to be, you know, an outrageous slapstick comedy, then we would need to sort of set that tone moving forward. Your cold open is kind of how people determine, it's like reading the first few pages of the book and it, it's determining if someone's going to keep watching or if they are not. So you have to make sure to let us know that we are on the proper ride. We're in line for the correct ride. Um, so make sure it was representative tonally of what is about to come. And um, it is going to be uh, something that act that can stand on its own or imagine that if somebody just watched that, then we want them to still come back and watch the rest of the episode because what, what happened in that cold open was so good, so funny, so scary, so interesting, so intriguing and mysterious that they have to come back and see the answers to those questions. So it's also about setting up questions. Questions that you will answer over the course of the first act, perhaps, and also questions that maybe the whole show will seek to answer. It's going to be putting those first few dominoes in motion that are going to start to tip over, and it's going to act as that kind of um, the, uh, the hook. It's going to hook us into the show and make us say, you have to keep watching if you want to see where that goes or what the answer to that is or why that happened. On, on mystery shows, this is almost always going to be you know a CSI-type show. We'll start with, there's a murder, or there's a person being chased by a murderer, then they turn around at the last second, they're like, it's you, and then someone else emerges and stabs them in the back, not the person we saw them say it's you about. And then they drop a key, and then the killer comes over to their body and takes something that's not the key, or he leaves a second key with them, and we're like, what does that mean? I thought they were getting robbed. But whatever it is, it has opened up this box of questions. And in a mystery show, a lot of the fun of why we're watching is to answer questions and to fill in gaps and to learn information. So if it's going to be a show that's based on that, then we open with questions. If it's going to be a show that's a comedy, we open with something funny. And generally, you're going to use this just to hint at what's coming. Often, this is going to be setting up your A story for the pilot. It doesn't, it doesn't always have to be setting up the A story, but often it's a good place to set up what the A story is going to be, to suggest everything that's going to come in that episode, and to um, you know orient the audience properly in terms of tone and subject matter for the show. Cool. Yeah, could I ask a could I ask a real round question? I've so mm -hmm. seen like in regard to Hook, there really seems to be in my head at the moment at least, and there are two ways you can typically do that, right? It's like you either make the car the the audience curious and like interested in that way, or you make them care. So it's like an emotional response. It seems like you can either. It seems like the most effective way in my head is to try to do both, and what I found is like a lot of the hooks cold openings tend to not go into any emphasis of the actual details of the character and I think a lot of the time I tap out for that reason around those moments because I don't get emotionally invested all that quickly so I was curious if you think that's something that's just you know made it more of a me thing but I have heard like uh, some really great breakdowns of like one of the great ways you can hook an audience is to like emphasize your characters like internal conflicts so like really quickly set us up to their desire and the fear and that's a good way of like it's like one of the reasons why i think like backstory always gets like to a degree when the kids are really young and something traumatic happens it constantly gets used by people like disney right it really sets up like context to why the characters are the way that they are and it immediately makes you care about them mm -hmm. i know you don't have to do it as like as clear cut as a backstory but it seems like it's there's a reason why it keeps happening for that reason so is there do you think that it's more about just peaking interest than anything or do you think that there is a unique way that you can in some sense combine those two together that 
could potentially be more impactful. Is it just purely interesting? You know? Well, it no depends doubt. what is interesting about your show and, and your world. If if, right. if the if the fact that your main character has a really fascinating, complex personality, and that and that sort of is at the heart of what makes your show fascinating, like think something like Mad Men, right? Where the it's mm -hmm. all about people talking in rooms, basically. So the thing that you could hook us with is like, well, why did he do that? What is he talking about? Like, why did he make that choice? Those things can both raise questions and reveal character. And you know, I, so I think that in and in some stories that aren't as about the you know deeply peeling back the layers of what makes Don Draper Don Draper, um, and shows that are more about you know the fun of cool heist sequences or complex sci-fi plots or something like that. It might not need something that is as deeply rooted in character to catch the audience's interest because they aren't watching for the same reason. Um, so it, you have to really look at what does your show offer, and and that's what I mean sort of in saying that Cold Open is a mini version of the appeal of your show, or it's like a, a trailer for the right. show in a way. It's, we have to find what is interesting and what is hooky about your world, whether that is character, emotional investment, or whether that is stuff happening in the plot, or whether that is a mystery that we don't have all the answers to yet. So you need to kind of just identify what is the central thing that could hook someone for your show, and you have to use that to do it. It's, it's not like there's going to be one size fits all that's going to work for every cold open, but you're right, you can, you can definitely do both. You can raise questions and also reveal character at the same time, but sometimes right. you can just do one or the other and that will it and depending on what your show is good at and what your show the ingredients that you're working with sometimes that'll help you pick one or the other that's a good point yeah because it seems like in some sense it's like the difference between giving answers up front up front to your audience and saying like this is why you should care and then going into the story that way or it's withholding answers and us making them create questions in some sense and then, mm -hmm. and then okay cool all right, I'll keep that in mind. Thank you very much. I, sure. That was all I really wanted to ask about, so thank you. Sure, sure. Good questions. So Lee mentioned maybe um, talking about types of scenes in um, our last 10 minutes here, so I'll get to this, and we'll just touch on conflict and discovery scenes, which is basically a distinction that I have made. I'm not sure if other people talk about them this way. A lot of people talk about every scene as a conflict scene, but I think the easiest way to break this down that I have done in the past is a scene's going to have substantial character conflict or it's not. That's not to say that every, that every single scene needs to have tons of conflict. In, in fact, they don't. Most of them do. About 75 to 80% of your scenes are going to be conflict scenes. We can define those or break those down as someone wants something, they attempt to get it, they get it or they don't, and that transitions us to the next moment. Discovery scenes are the other types of scenes. And if that is not the case, if we don't have character wants something, tries to get it and gets it or doesn't, then it might be a discovery scene, in which case we might be using this to establish or convey something to the audience. We don't necessarily need any characters in it or any words spoken. We could just show the, we could just show stuff happening. We might think of these a little bit like informational scenes, but it's more active than that. I call this discovery because imagine that the audience is kind of the main character in the scene, and they are actively learning something. And we're telling the audience, or they're discovering something, I should say, that they don't already know. And that might be as simple as, you know, your character seems to be like a nice stay-at-home mom and in our first couple scenes, and then, I don't know, maybe your act break is going to be we slowly phase through her wall and there's a bunch of, you know, people chained up in her basement. And we're like, oh my gosh, what happened there? Our, our, like, we, we thought that she was so nice. It turns out she's a serial killer. Whatever it is, but the, the whole scene might have just been, I don't know, we slowly move through an air vent until we find her prisoners or something like that, right? Is there a conflict in a camera moving to a place? Not really, but there's discovery in it. We're learning something. Anytime the camera is just doing something on its own, it's sort of like, a, it's often a, a discovery scene. Or maybe a character could just be doing some research in a library and they find out some shocking truth. That might be a discovery scene as well. It can include emotion. It ab absolutely can include emotion. I mean, if your character is doing some research and they learn that their mother was a serial killer, for instance, to stick on the same tr uh, t topic, um, and there may not have been a substantial conflict to them reading a book and finding out that that was the case, but once they learn that, once they discover that, that's going to be a shocking moment for them, and we're going to watch them react, and maybe they, I don't know, throw the book off the table and burst into tears. Whatever it is that they do, it's going to be interesting, and it's going to be intriguing, and it's going to include emotion and make you continue to invest in that story, and that still is a step in the ultimate journey that that character is making, even though it didn't have substantial conflict in it. Um, it might lead us to conflict soon that's an important part of discovery scenes too is that they're linking scenes of conflict and every once in a while you'll need a scene without any 
where we just I think there was even there's a scene in um, Lee's pilot that she met, that I read earlier today where um, the the plumber's assistant leaves the room and the main the the uh, older senior plumber uh, he magically controls the water to clean it up is that right Lee? Yes, that's accurate. Great. Okay, it's but there's in the no cold open. Oh, it's in the cold open, so maybe it's not its own mm -hmm. whole scene. It's just sort of the end of that scene. But for instance, you you could have done that as like a half page scene or maybe even full page, right? Where your your uh, the assistant leaves the plumber now he's going to just show us what he's capable of and it's going to raise that question of why could he do that what was happening there and it's going to be intriguing and interesting and invite you to keep watching to to learn the answer um so that's the difference between conflict and discovery obviously if you have that just as like the cap at the end of a conflict scene that's that's fine too but you can see how that could work as a whole scene on its own um, as long as we are discovering something new. If we already knew that he could do that, then wasting a whole page on watching him do it again would be of no use to us. So, um, if a scene doesn't have strong character conflict, and it doesn't reveal any, we don't discover anything new, then it almost certainly does not belong in the show or in the movie. Unless you're writing Slice of Life anime, which several of our group members have talked about before, in which case, I think you can kind of just do whatever you want. Um, but if you're writing in the Western style of feature and TV writing, generally a scene needs to include conflict or show us something we didn't know before or else it just shouldn't be in there. Um, so just a couple last notes. Remember, scenes are going to be between one and three pages, and you can use my sort of cheat sheet method if you want to of... You know, pick one, two, two or three to begin with, and, or pick one to begin with, and then add an extra page to that sketch or to the um, to the outline for more than two principal characters. Lots of dialogue, lots of action. Add you add a, a solid page. Was there one more thing in my list? Lots of dialogue, lots of action, more than two characters, or I think that's the main things. I, m I may have had one more thing, but if you just imagine adding in a, a, a page for each of those. And that'll help you determine if your scene is going to be one, two, three, or four. Just keep in mind, if you have lots of people talking and lots of characters with different objectives, then scenes can easily swell to four pages or bigger, but that should only be, like, you should only have, like, one or two of those in the entire thing. If you're writing a half hour, a four-page scene is almost half an entire act. Um, you, If you only had four-page scenes, you would have three scenes per act at the absolute most, so that'd be a problem. Um, keep Start with action. Don't spend too much time setting scenery. Be succinct, get right to the point, and keep your tense active almost the entire time. Try to use these scenic details as a pacing mechanism between action rather than writing beat, beat, beat. Try to use stuff going on in the world to both build out that sense of atmosphere and also environment, as well as fulfilling that dual role of kind of adding pacing and timing to conversations. Okay, um, I will take questions on conflict or discovery scenes because that may have been new stuff to some students here. Does everybody feel like they have a handle on the two major types of scenes in dramatic writing? I see a thumb up emoji. Um, I just had a question in regard to like maybe a good way of thinking about it like discovery seems to be like, and it's sort of like revealing something to the audience. Like, it seems in some sense it's less about generating questions and giving answers in those moments. Is that kind of what separates those two? Like, conflict in some sense seems to, you know, necessitate... Oh, conflict in some sense, sense seems necessary to sort of, like, create questions or is rather, like, a, a, a consequence of creating questions. I don't know. Is that... Am I thinking about it generally in the right way, or is that... Well, you can, you can do both. You can create... Um, you can create great questions in either conflict or, or discovery scenes. And, and often discovery scenes are going to be about, well, why did that happen? Why did we see that? Why did the camera linger on that, right? Like, why did we show that? Um, what is okay. that actually going to end up meaning? So those, those can all be great questions that can be followed up on shortly, or, you know, either shortly afterwards or maybe way later. Um, but uh, yeah, just discovery scenes and conflict scenes are both going to create questions and, and just like things that need to be followed up on or paid off later in the story. That's a good point. All right, thank you. Sure. Um, Lee, you mentioned this was new to you. Does this conflict and discovery thing all make sense? Yes, totally. 
And I mentioned in the chat, um, I noticed that all the examples you gave of discovery scenes were also very solidly plot relevant. So it wasn't like discovery about here's how this character might think about something that might happen at some point. It was they were very clearly like, no, we're revealing a detail, whether it's internal or external, that is going to specifically relate to the plot in this episode. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. Exactly. So discovery. We don't generally say, like, you discover a dust bunny on your floor. You notice a dust bunny on your floor. You discover something important, right? We discover a right. clue. We discover a um, an aspect of a character we didn't realize was there before. Um, we, we might, like, uh, dis discover some new question or discover some new tactic or some new plan or some new obstacle. Um, but those are all important things. If we're discovering something that doesn't matter, it doesn't really feel like a discovery. Right. Awesome. Thank you. Sure, sure. So we're pretty much wrapping up. Um, I've, I've done these other slides in the past before, but if this is helpful for you, I can link this in the chat and you can use this kind of checklist. You don't have to write out this checklist per every single scene, but if you're struggling with a scene or it's not working or you're just wondering how to start, then this um, slide 37 on this will just give you some, like a framework to use. There's examples marked up on the documents following this. So on slides 38 and 39, there's a whole scene that and oh, sorry up to 40 actually and then on 41 there's examples of scenes that are marked up with all these different aspects so you know who's the main character frame what the scene 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 seems to be about build intrigue ask a question use tactics and find the fun surprise us get to the point hit a strong end note and get out early clarify what's changed and what is the emotional impact then transition to the next scene that's kind of a basis you can use for conflict scenes um and possibly discovery scenes too, but just if you're, you know, and don't, don't feel the need to do it every time, but you can apply this in retrospect as like a kind of diagnostic tool to assess how to make a scene better if that seems like it would be helpful for you. Okay, so let me just open to any questions on anything we talked about today or things that are going to prevent you from getting to your full set of scene cards by next weekend, same time. Last questions. And if there's no questions, we will be meeting thank you on the 27th. So much, as always. Sure, thank you for coming by, guys. Um, we'll be meeting on the 27th at the same time. We have three weeks of the class left. Um, so turn in the full set of scene cards for next time. And also, you want to um, read another complete TV pilot. We're going to be asking about that every time. So keep up the reading pilots, even if you've already read a couple for the course so far. Be ready to talk about what you learned, what did you notice, what did you like, anything like that. And um, you can put those scene cards in the assignments channel if you want me to take a glance at them before next class. All right, thanks, guys. Um, we'll hopefully see you next time. And we have a bunch of stuff this, on the weekend, obviously, such as uh, we have feature class tomorrow. Or sorry, Sunday, feature class Sunday from 11 to 1. We have lab tomorrow from 4 to 6. We have fantasy group on Sunday. We have table read on Sunday. Plenty of things to do coming up. So we hope to see you guys soon. Have a great rest of your night.